All right. Well, we, here we are at the lecture 14, which is roughly halfway, and we're going to be our, doing our first group theory of the kind that most people are familiar with, and that is uh, the finite group groups, plural, uh, that are not commutative. And the smallest example of that, and the one that we're going to really concentrate on for at least two lectures and show applications to, probably in three or four, is called D3. Uh, it has another name, C3V, for a group that's slightly different. We're going to explain that. I'm also going to explain what it means to be isomorphic. And uh, we're going to show a number of ways to make uh, products uh, easily. Uh, a little thing I call the D3 group slide rule is sitting there. We'll build that and explain it. The uh, basic idea is to use uh, group elements as labels. Uh, now it's really getting to be important, so we'll explain that again. And also, we'll bring back the Ham Hamilton's turns from Lecture 8 uh, to uh, examine products as well. So this is basically, uh, this first part of the lecture today is what mathematicians might call group theory as well, but we're going to definitely have a physical application in mind, and I'll mention those as we go along. And then uh, the idea of equivalence transformations in classes, something we didn't need for abelian groups. Now they're really important. And the whole idea of having uh, an algebra made out of uh, classes of elements, that is, sums of elements within uh, what we'll define as a class, uh, those make up a subalgebra of the entire group algebra that we're going to need to learn in order to do the um, heavy lifting that non abelian group theory uh, requires. In this case, this group only has six elements, and three of them are in the center of the algebra for this group, and we'll explain why that is and how that works and do some of the uh, uh, group theory that's connected with that. Uh, that's going to involve something called Lagrange's theorems. Uh, we have Lagrange theorems not just for subgroups, which is found in most books, but also for classes. And they are the same thing, as it turns out, if you do it carefully. Now, before we do that, though, I have to bring up the mock-mock principle. And the idea of uh, using uh, non-abelian group uh, expansions to define Hamiltonians, just like we did for the abelian groups. But because they don't commute, we have to do something pretty tricky. And so that will uh, occupy the middle of, of the lecture today, and it is, I, th I think, uh, very cool and very beautiful. And we're going to make use of that for the rest of the class. And uh, the first stage of the spectral decomposition of this global slash local uh, Hamiltonian and everything connected with it uh, is uh, the topic of the end of, of the end of the thing, and we'll see. Uh, of various things, the all commuting operators that make the class algebra, which is the center, and what these properties are, uh, the all commuting projectors that are made out of, of those, um, these three guys right there, and uh, some numbers that uh, characterize all groups, but in particular the finite groups that we're working on. What I call the centrum, the rank, and the order. The order, everyone knows about. That's just the number of elements. Today, we only have six as we work with our uh, trigonal uh, symmetry here. So um, let's uh, go ahead and get started here. And that is, uh, let's just look at what these groups look like and uh, what a product uh, table looks like for uh, this uh, group. Also, where do they sit in the collection of groups that we showed last time? Um, of the 32 uh, crystal point groups, those that uh, could uh, occupy a uh, regular lattice of some kind, <clears throat> like uh, graphene, uh, D3 uh, and C3, both are symmetries of graphene. 
and uh, those are the two groups that we're going to uh, focus on today. But um, we should see the context again uh, for them, where, where they uh, live. Uh, again, this is the uh, histogram that I showed before uh, as a function of order, starting with the group C1, which has only one element, we didn't say much about it, but C2, C3, C4, C5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's a cyclic group for every number, so there's at least one group, and you can see a, a solid dark band going up there uh, for uh, one element, having one element. Everybody's got, um, <clears throat> or I should say, uh, having one element, or two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements. It's always a cyclic group uh, for that number. But, uh, and of course, they're abelian, so that's the uh, dark darkness here. But the non-abelian ones, shall we say, the groups that uh, uh, really do things. Uh, that's the white part of the histogram and a little number above that indicates how many there are. Now this is a logarithmic uh, plot here. Uh, we're basically uh, writing down the number of two is right here, one is right there. So it's not, uh, as you can see, two uh, is uh, not, the one is not just a half of two on a logarithmic exponential plot here. So the next line is 4 uh, right here. There's 3 and 5 for an 8th order group. We'll talk a little bit about that. But our group that we're working with is in the column here 6. And C6 is one of those groups. The other one, there's two of them, is the group we'll talk about today, which is D3 or alias C3V. They are essentially the same as a mathematician would consider their product structure. Okay, uh, is there anything else I need to say? Uh, our friend D2 that we talked about last time is one of the groups of order four. Uh, they are all abelian, all uh, uh, two of the groups that live in the fork uh, slot here, uh, C4 and D2. Uh, D2 being a C2 cross C2. We talked a little about uh, that cross product. We're going to talk some more about that uh, today as well. Now I should point out that um, the fourfold uh, groups C4V and D4, we'll talk about them a little bit later. There they are up here. Uh, they're a group of order eight. Each one is related, that is, they are the same uh, as far as a mathematician would be, be concerned. And we'll talk about them a little bit later. With, uh, they have a friend, the quaternion group, uh, that is also order eight. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what has the symmetry uh, D3? Well, remember when we talked about D2, I showed you a two-bladed propeller that uh, would could be put on the ceiling upside down or right side up. It didn't make any difference. It would still blow the air in the same direction for a given rotation. Here's three-bladed propeller, okay? And the idea is that this three-bladed propeller can be rotated 180 degrees around each of the blades, just like the D2 one, except there's three axes now. And that's, those are the uh, operations that don't commute. Uh, this thing obviously also has C3 symmetry. You can do a 120 degree rotation in either direction or twice. And that's uh, two elements of the group right there. These three things are the uh, other three besides the identity. So all six elements are thereby accounted for. The thing that's isomorphic to that is a group called C3V, C3 vertical. And if z-axis were vertical, then uh, these are vertical planes, and that's, I guess, where the name comes from, C3V. Uh, the name cyclic in C3V is pretty obvious. The name D here refers to dihedral angles. I guess that's a dihedral angle there. Um, in any case, that's, this is called Schoenfli's notation for groups, and we're going to stick with it because it is the most commonly used uh, one. We, we can argue a little bit about that now that solid-state physics is, is taking a different turn, but um, that's pretty much it. 
any case, we're going to de develop the slide rule for both of these groups at once. Uh, and there's just a slight variation in notation where rows get replaced by sigmas. Um, reflections versus rotations, you see. They're kind of doing the same thing as far as this uh, group is concerned. So we need to show that they're isomorphic. Isomorphic means mathematically the same abstract group, same multiplication table, even if it's very physically different uh, and, and involves different physics uh, and when we use it. Now let's look a little bit about the matrices uh, and their eigenvalues that might come up uh, in this um, thing. Uh, here we're talking about a, for example, uh, a y-axis rotation. Let's just look at the a propeller blade that happens to be along the y-axis. It's the only one that's along the Cartesian axis, so that's um, pretty common to do that. If you only have one, pick y because its irreducible representations are, uh, of our y rotation is going to be real. But in any case, this is a, a group that changes the sign of the x component and the z component, but does not change or do anything to the y component. So there's a 3 by 3 matrix representation of this element. And um, this one has a similar, uh, shall we say, uh, country cousin, uh, uh, row 3 and sigma 3, okay? And now sigma 3 is a plane that's perpendicular, that is normal uh, to the y-axis. And to relate these two, you simply have to uh, take uh, this matrix and multiply everything by minus 1. So uh, the sigma 3 mirror plane leaves the x and the z-axis unchanged, plus 1 and plus 1 in both the first and the third uh, position here, but it of course reflects the y axis, so you have a minus sign there. So instead of a plus, a minus, and then the same for the first and the third. Okay? So that's a little bit of a, a piece of matrix geography that we should be aware of. And that is a, a mirror plane reflection sigma, reflection sigma equals a 180 degree axial rotation, that's this guy right here, times inversion. Inversion is this thing called I. Now I is nothing but one with a minus sign in front of it, the unit matrix with a minus. That's I. And it commutes with every possible element in three dimensions. Uh, and that generalizes to four and five and so many, so many dimensions. But this is obviously just a unit matrix by minus 1. So if I take that thing and multiply my row 3, I get a sigma 3. So that's what I was talking about uh, here. And that's worth, worth uh, you know, remembering. Worth remembering the way to think about a mirror plane for reflection ref related to a 180 degree rotation around it. Okay? Is that reasonable. This is sort of geometry behind all of the group theory, and it's really good to have a, a feeling for that, you see. <clears throat> and again, we're using the letter sigma for reflections, and that's fair, and we'll make a connection to that later uh, br briefly. Okay? So, I say again, inversion I equal minus now these are bold face things representing matrices, in this case three by three matrices, but in general could represent a whole, there could be lots of different matrices that would represent these uh, abstract operators. And it'll commute with every single rotation, uh, no matter where it is, not just these, but all of the uh, R3 rotations. All right, now we also have row two, well, row two, that axis, is perpendicular to this one. So I times row two is equal to sigma two, just like uh, uh, sigma three here is uh, inversion times row three, this uh, row axis right here. And finally, the first uh, row, uh, the uh, 
D3, row 1, okay, uh, this down here pointing into the board, uh, that thing, mirror plane reflection times row 1 with uh, inversion gives you the mirror plane reflection. Okay, so there's three of these, that's the connection between these groups as far as the actual geometry uh, goes. So the D3 is, is completely made of things that you can do with classical operation. This thing's made of things that if I had to try to actually do a reflection of this thing, I'd probably have to break some things to do it. And if it's a complicated object, a molecule of some kind, well, um, it's not something ordinary mortals can reflect. However, if it's made of waves, reflections are what waves like to do. Waves do not rotate well. So when you're thinking about waves, reflections are the things to uh, appeal to. Uh, rotations are better for us. We have a pretty good feeling uh, about how you do uh, rigid Sorry. rotations. Sorry, is the yeah. C3 is the reflection of the D3? Say that again. Is C3 is the reflection of D3? Well, uh, C3V is, it, you're asking, is it a reflection? It's a mapping between them. There's a mapping. Okay. Yeah. There's a mapping. And it's, um, I, as far as the three operations besides the C3 operations, I'm not going to multiply um, R here by an inversion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but these three are related by those little equations there. Sigma equal I times rho. Uh, in this case, three for that one. And that's what we're talking about when we multiply these matrices. There's a rho matrix right there. There's the inversion right there. And there's the actual sigma for all three components, x, y, and z. Z is, you know, on its side here. So perhaps uh, I is not, the inversion truly is not an element of C3V? It's a no, tool. No, these, these elements, these objects here cannot uh, claim I as a symmetry. Okay, it's a tool to do the, yeah. the geometry. Now later we'll have uh, objects that do uh, claim I as a symmetry. These are not uh, in that uh, situation. However, I times uh, rotations gives me a symmetry uh, here, as you can see. I'm doing I times rho there to get a sigma. And sigma is a symmetry for this, not a symmetry for this. I cannot reflect, mirror reflect in the x-plane here and get put the blade up here and it would be turned uh, right-handed instead of left-handed. Yes? I'm, I'm following the row three and sigma three. I can understand row three, and I want to understand sigma three through that picture. From this picture, it's gonna make yes. just y minus. Yeah, I, I got it. You I got think. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it leaves x and z <laughs> unchanged. When you're in a mirror plane, you're yeah. safe from that reflection, right? For that one is rotation. For this one is reflection. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yes. I can do 180 on around the, that. Now yes, that one is actually hard to see. Y. Around, around Y. Yes, I can do 180 of that thing. 180 degree. And you y. say, does that thing really come back and look the same after I do 180? Yeah. Well, you can see that right here I just turn it around, so that isn't hurt, right? But this guy's got to go and be that. Is that how we? And it's true. And of course, you should have. It's not going to work. I mean, should, that that fan is not going to work like before. Uh, yes, it will. <laughs> it will. Yes, and let me pull the D two fan down from the ceiling. Unfortunately, I um, forgot to get this um, animal out, but it's worth uh, just uh, discussing that issue with respect to this thing. Everything's okay. all fair. <laughs> you see, so remember we had, and let me bring it up front here so we're on the camera. Here is <laughs> D2, right? <laughs> and you can, your, your mind is very happy, I think, with me doing that. 
In other words, I start with a 1 here, and I do an RZ, right? Okay, yeah, it's the same blade except for the markings, right? But if I do this, that is, rotate around the x-axis, okay, that's the it's work. You see, it's the same fan, you see? Uh, the, I, I just rotated some planes around themselves. They have a symmetry axis right down their middle. The thing is a little bent, right? But don't let that it's bother you. Work. But yeah. this is also an operation, you see, yeah. okay? And so is this. I can turn it completely over, RY. Why is that at you, pointing at you? It's gonna work. And it's still the same fan. It's the same fan. Yeah. It will blow the air down. When it, it right. And so is this one. It can be turned over three ways. This one can be turned over this way, or it can be turned over this way, right? And finally, it can be rotated like that, which is not turning it over, right? So. That's a piece of symmetry lore that really takes a little bit of thinking. Maybe a lot of thinking. But you can carry it with you. Yes, you, you definitely can uh, make things that have this symmetry very easily. And it doesn't have to be at 45 degrees either. When it is at 45 degrees, that's a, a higher symmetry. You see, it can be a low pitch or a high pitch fan continuum of change provided I do it to both blades or all three here and I've got that uh, di high dihedral symmetry. This is more obvious. You see the reflections it's as though uh, we can think waves there pretty pretty easily. You see and so you can see right away I can do a mirror reflection there because those go into each other no problem and I can do it here too it's just the same and they can put that mirror in action and bring these two across. It's, it's very immune to reflections and you can see that quite easily. As I say, this one is a little harder uh, to grasp because, you know, we're, to, we're not uh, completely cued in on doing all three rotations. So does, it, does that make uh, sense so far? Um, and we have to, of course, show that take the fan the group off and remount it and still use the right hand rotation yeah. that blows in the same direction. Yeah, for this one. Right. And this one doesn't have any handedness. You see, this one has chirality. You see, that one doesn't. Okay? So, yeah, th th these are the, the, as I say, the first step into non-abelian symmetry but that's abelia. That 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 uh, uh, one is abelia for classical objects, not for electrons. We'll mention that today as well. Okay. All right. Now, uh, if there's anything else uh, showing this is isomorphic. That is, that they uh, share the same character table. If you do a product, and we're going to do products fairly shortly there. If I do a product, say of row one and row two, we're going to learn how to do that efficiently, or row one in a uh, rotation, either R1 or R2, R1 and, or R squared. Um, R squared isn't drawn here, <clears throat> but um, you can imagine it just going the other way. Um, the, the, for th this product, row one and row two, you see the product sigma one, sigma two would just be rho i times rho 2i, and i commutes, so you put the two i's together, and two i's together makes a 1, you see. So whatever rho 1 times rho 2 does is sigma 1 times sigma 2 is going to do exactly the same thing. Now it gets a little squirrely when I take a rho 1 and multiply it by 120 degree rotation. Is that like sigma 1 times r? Well, no, it isn't, because I only have one i in there. So what I'm going to end up with, you see, is a, um, a, a row one with an eye hanging off of it. It can hang anywhere at once because it commutes with everything. So uh, when we put the groups together, we have to realize that the uh, sigma operations are doing, are putting some, um, shall we say, uh, 
improper rotation uh, or improper symmetry operation. It's improper, uh, uh, this operator. This is the most improper operator. Uh, it, it, that operator uh, is improper in the sense that I am asking to kill you if I invert you. If I invert you, you see, I take every atom on this side and put it down there, you see. I rip it out and put it down there and glue it back together again, right? In the process, you're dead, right? To a molecule like that, it's dissociated, you see, most of them. They just can't invert. Invert is an improper. Whenever the determinant is negative, that's the clue that it's changing right to left. And most things can't stand to do that. So uh, the, the operators sigma are improper, but all these are proper. So we have to make uh, a re, you know, clear relationship that, uh, sure, we're going to get the same group table as far as a mathematician is concerned for both of these. And that's what we mean by being isomorphic. They, once we learn one of these groups, we've learned all of the algebraic properties of the other. And we're going to have a whole family of groups that are isomorphic to each other, completely physically different. The, the group theory is very helpful because it tells you, oh, they're all isomorphic. Just do one and you got the numbers for the others. Okay, products. How do you do them? Okay. First of all, we get used to the notation of moving something from what I'll call the uh, original place. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six places here. One for every element in the group. So I just arbitrarily say the one goes there. And then if I do a rotation by 120 degrees, then whatever it was here that was called one, say a wave is sitting there doing something, I move that with this operation, then it's vibrating up here. And I call that state R uh, to the first power. We usually leave the power off uh, uh, on our, when we write them out, but I'm being explicit here. Okay? So that paints an R1 into that sector there. We have to paint the, the sectors, then we have our slide rule. Okay? For example, sigma 1. You have to know where the plane is, and the plane's not going to move, but whatever was sitting here is going to move, and it's going to reflect. So I'm going to name the wave when it's sitting in this place the state sigma 1. As just as I name the wave when it's sitting in this position on this little frying pan, uh, 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 the state r to the first power. The ket r to the first power. Here's the ket sigma sub 2. Okay? There's the sigma 2 plane. Okay? It's going to take the one uh, thing, whatever it is, and drive it through the mirror, reflect it over to there. Okay? And there's sigma 3. The only thing missing now is r squared. Okay? If I do a rotation this way to get r1, I would do a similar thing over here to get that r2. Okay? So here is the, uh, the, the slide rule that uh, we were talking about. Okay? Now, unfortunately, it's a little faint. Uh, the the uh, pieces here because I'm, I'm, I'm making a point of using this slide rule. This is where we use uh, this group slide rule. Uh, let's go back here and this is where we built the slide rule. There's the R squared. I should have pointed that out. So all six uh, places that the group operators can take things to are indicated by the operator that brung them. <laughs> Brought them. <laughs> Sorry. This is Arkansas, right? <laughs> okay, so um, you've got three uh, sort of places for sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. You'll, you'll notice that the planes are oriented that way, okay? If I go uh, ca uh, counterclockwise, it's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Okay, 
for the points of an equilateral triangle. If I go clockwise, they're neighbors, one, two, and three. There's various, various things to help you remember, uh, you know, the slide rule so you can write it down uh, without, you know, having to memorize too much. Okay, so this is building the, the C3V group slide rule. The, um, the other one will be just about the same thing, except you'll have rows replacing the sigmas. Kind of tells you it's isomorphic uh, when you see that. Okay, but how do you use it? Suppose, suppose I want to uh, multiply an element sigma 1 times r to the first power. Which, which element uh, will I get? Well, R1 is the first one to act on Kets, and normally we consider the operators on the right-hand side to be the ones that are going to get to act first, because we almost always work on Kets. And if that's the case, then uh, I'm just going to call the state R1 times 1, R1. Okay? So we're going to be asking, what does sigma 1 do to the state R1? Well, what's the state R1? The state R1 is where something is going on in the R1 sector. And we're about to do a sigma 1 uh, reflection uh, of that, of that uh, uh, thing. There's a sigma 1 uh, plane, right? And it's going to take this thing and put it over there. Okay, it's going to put it over in the, uh, in the sigma 2 uh, sector. Okay, that's basically, uh, didn't show it too well there, but that's, that's it, okay? So, uh, what you're doing is you're getting the result, sigma 1 times R1 is sigma 2. You just look at where the planes are and you look at what opera operation or, or what uh, group element uh, sector uh, you want to have a, a, a do something and as I say, the factor R1 on the right acts first on kits. Left is last. It's kind of like Hebrew and many other languages that are read from this side right over to this side left. Okay? So this is, this is the basic idea of a group slide rule. Okay? Now we have a very big one sitting over in the corner there. Which you, could, you might swivel it over around there and uh, look at it. This is the lecture variety of uh, slide rules, and it's the one that goes with the octahedral uh, horizontal group. The full octahedral symmetry is codified on that, and we'll be getting to that uh, soon enough. But uh, D3 is on there, along with C3V, they're both on that cube. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can see how powerful it is to have uh, this kind of slide rule uh, work. Now, go ahead uh, and just apply sigma 1 to the whole group. Just see what happens to sigma 1 when it hits uh, very something. We don't have to work, think very hard about what happens to sigma 1 when it hits the unit operator. That's sigma 1. And we just did sigma 1 times r1. That gives you sigma 2. What does uh, sigma 1 do to, uh, to r to the second power? Okay, uh, Where is uh, r to the second power? It happens to be hiding right there. Now I realize now that that's not showing very well, so let's remember what we're doing. We're acting with sigma 1. Let's go back and look at the, uh, the actual slide rule with everything exposed. Okay, We're doing sigma 1 plane. Okay, and we can see that when it hit, hit, hits R1, it takes it across the mirror to sigma 2. When it hits um, R squared, it sends it across to sigma 3. Reflection and that plane, bingo. Okay, and when sigma 1 hits sigma 3, it, it sends it to R2. And then when sigma 1 hits sigma 1, guess what? it sends it to the unit. A reflection squared is definitely the unit. Okay? So th this makes a very powerful way to, you know, do products. We're going to have to do a few. 
uh, as we work with these groups. And uh, that's the basic idea, you see, the way you get uh, the whole group table. There's the multiplication table for not just signal one, but all the sigmas and all the r's. And of course, one times anything is itself. So this is kind of redundant. Very often, we would leave the top row off <coughs> and the side here just show that much. That's your multiplication table. Okay, and this is C3V, but it's going to be the same table uh, when we go uh, with the rows. And so this, this pretty clearly shows they're isomorphic. The only thing that's different is the notation for the last three operators, the ones that uh, are either 180 rotations, like that, this thing actually turns it over. And, you know, to be uh, really strict about this, if I'm going to turn something over, right, uh, maybe I ought to draw it upside down when it gets uh, there. But the same is true with the mirror there. If I'm going to do reflections, I ought to be drawing the uh, symbols backwards. I don't go quite that far with this slide roll. It's supposed to just sit there and you can imagine uh, all that happening. Okay, now, this particular table is called a GG dagger form. We mentioned this already with the cyclic groups. What I've done is I've taken the groups in the order that is natural. Uh, it could be any order, but let's just say this particular order, and I replace every element up here with the inverse of the one that's in that position here. One is its own inverse, but r to the first power is the inverse of r to the second power, and r to the second is the inverse of r to the one. That's the cyclic three group that we've studied already. And then the sigmas are their own inverses, as we've seen as well. All of that so I get ones on the diagonal, and I can play the games with the matrix representations. But we're going to play two games with that today. Okay, now back to the uh, table of groups, just to uh, point out where a few things are. Uh, we've just been uh, looking uh, here. Let's see if I've got it. There's the D4 and the C4 of uh, V. They also have a relation to like what we've just uh, described. D3 and C3 V are not counted twice in the column of six elements, order of six of the group, there are only two groups, C6 and then these two that we've uh, been talking about, uh, D3 and C3V. Okay. Now the other group of order six that uh, we talked about before um, was C6. That's a thing uh, well, I'm not, actually not drawing the picture of it here. The picture of it here would be uh, a propeller-like uh, a thing, uh, a paddle wheel with kinks on it. Uh, there's also a group called C3I, also all, all, often called S3, but I want to mix up S with the substitution group, uh, which is much more uh, mathematically correct. And then C3H, this is C3V. C3H, if it's horizontal, it's just like C6 cross C2. It's a C3 cross uh, reflections. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's these two that we're uh, focused on today because they're they're non-abelian. All the little circle guys here, all these uh, these 16 little circles, uh, including that one right there and that one right there, C6, are abelian. Uh, remember, this is chapter three of Principles of Symmetry, Dynamics, and Spectroscopy, and that's the non-abelian chapter. So there's 16 groups in crystal symmetry. Uh, possibilities here uh, that are non-abelian, including our monster OH, which uh, is the largest of them. Okay, now uh, D4 and C4, again, not counted as separate groups. So there's only two non-abelian groups. One of them is these guys. The, the uh, tetragonal symmetry, you should probably call it that. There's another one called the quaternion group, which is a group made out of those quaternions that we talked about when we were doing the SU2 stuff. Okay? And then 
there are all the abelian groups that can be made with eight elements. Obviously, one of them is C8, but another one is C4 cross C2, and another one after that is C2 cross C2 cross C2. None of those are isomorphic. They are different groups. We need to talk about that, but we'll do that later. We sort of hit on a little bit of that before. However, when the, the integers that you're talking about, C3 and C2, for example, um, are, uh, not, uh, are, are relatively prime, that is, share no common factor, then C6 and C3 cross C2 are the same group. A little bit of number theory. And number theory is behind everything that happens in group theory. So it's worth uh, spending some time with that, too. We'll do that later. And then, of course, there's our old friend C2 cross C2, which is a group of order uh, 4. Remember that that's not isomorphic to C4. C4 requires you to raise every uh, rot rotator to four powers to get one. This one, every one of them gets to one by a second power. That's different group, different structure. Okay, now here's another way to get um, multiplication of group elements. We mentioned this before in lecture eight. Uh, spent a few pages, 65 to 78, 13 pages of Hamilton's turns. The idea is if you want to rotate by a given angle omega, you set your mirror planes at omega over 2. And we showed the geometry of that before. So that means that you can uh, do a rotation by omega, at least of an image, uh, simply by having two mirrors that you can look at. Uh, better to be actually be able to see through them if you want to see the whole thing. But um, that means then that you can characterize uh, the effect of that rotation by an arrow that is half the angle that you actually want to rotate. So there's omega over 2 and there's 2 pi uh, minus omega over 2. Well, uh, that let, lets us do this magic trick where if I want to do two rotations, any direction and any angle, I simply have to draw their great circle arcs, their great circle arc, that would be the great circle arc there for this rotation, and now I got another one that's just come on the scene, and I need to draw its great circle arc, and whatever length I want to actually rotate, divided by two. And then, if this is the first one, and that's the second one, then all I have to do is draw a great circle arc through the head of the second one and the tail of the first one, i.e. this great circle arc, and I have found both the direction and the magnitude over two of the, of the final rotation. So just to remind you of that incredible um, piece of geometry that Hamilton uh, discovered, apparently being the first, as I, that I know of, to discover it. All working, you see, because I can slide the arc for any of these uh, great circles anywhere I want. The, the moving this mirror, as long as I keep the relative uh, angle the same, does exactly the same job. So that's why I draw the great circle arcs and I move the first one to the intersection, putting its head there, and then I take the arc, the other one's been sliding around with not knowing where to go, and I put it so its tail is there, and then I can make a product, which is this. Why can we divide omega to omega, omega to two? Okay, now, that goes back uh, to lecture eight, where, if you recall, we started out first with a mirror this way, so we called that um, sigma y because it reflected in the y direction, and then there was sigma x, right? I mean, no, whatever notation we use uh, is yeah. immaterial, really. But then I showed you, uh, if I took a linear combination of those two, put it, you know, an angle, uh, say, uh, uh, well, 
I, I think I, I set it at angle phi, okay, and, and did this uh, reflection first and then did that one, I got a rotation by twice, I'm sorry, uh, twice, yes, I, I mean twice the angle between the mirrors. So that's what this is based on. And, and that, uh, I, I suppose I could go f find that now, but uh, I would just say you, you should take a look at page 65. That's where we, we really did that, okay? And we were talking about spinners, so th this fit into that, right? And that one half is, well, it's part of the lore of spin a half, you see. Re really quite mysterious stuff. So I, I'm, I'm not criticizing you for asking that question. I'm just uh, unable at this time to easily pull up uh, that particular thing. Um, if, uh, if TC can find it quickly, we could uh, I'll bring if that you add, up. If you add two omega, we, we can get the omega double prime. And this would be some other vector. Remember the Darbu labeling, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is the crank vector. Can can we get that omega, the omega prime? No, the omega double prime. If we add omega prime and omega. You mean as just plain old 3D vectors? Yeah. You'd get some vector in between there like that. Is that exactly omega double prime? No. It's not? No. It, what you're going to be adding are the arcs. Oh. And it's going to be half the... The, the arc's magnitude is going to be half of what you actually wanted to rotate. Because it, it knows the spinner space where things go half as fast, right? Half quanta. Okay? So that's the actual number here. And that's what makes this, you remember the slide rule, uh, this thing, uh, work. Okay? That's how we get to play that, that game. Okay? It's quite a mysterious thing, right? It's, it's not a... Uh, uh, something that everyone knows. They should, but <laughs> they don't. <laughs> um, and uh, that makes it possible for us to uh, find products in some extraordinary situations, which I'll show a little bit again uh, here. We did already show some uh, before. Um, this is the next, um, the next uh, installment to this particular one. I should point out that this is something I put in that old book principles of symmetry, dynamics, and spectra, which you can pull up, and you'll get pictures that are black and white and kind of fuzzy, uh, like these. Uh, uh, but if you want the latest stuff, uh, this is uh, uh, chapter 10 in uh, uh, unit three, I believe. Uh, yes, because there are three chapters in each unit up that point, and then you get one more. Uh, quantum th uh, theory uh, for the computer age. Uh, there's the Hamilton turn uh, shown with the Darbu symbol. Now, uh, TC, I don't I know. I fear we have network issues. Oh, uh, we it's do. been loading for almost a minute now. Okay. So and that's our internal network. That is the quarters, problem. Three quarters downloaded on that. Yeah. Metro eight. So, no problem. Yeah. We'll. Uh, about it. If, if it uh, comes up okay. later, uh, we can. Uh, Go and look at it. Excellent. It'll be in the yeah. world next time. And uh, it'll be in lecture eight. And anyway, this is a picture that's also in um, this particular uh, unit three, chapter ten of um, quantum theory for the computer age. And it has a lot more to it, uh, which we, we're going to come back to that a uh, later on. But what I wanted to show you, just to sort of uh, do a little previewing here, is that this particular way of getting products can take account of the spin a half uh, geometry. Uh, if you have a particle that has half integral spin, you cannot ignore the minus signs in the group table uh, for D3 or C3V. Uh, these are the minus signs. Now, Please notice that the notation here is for a group that's twice as big as D3. It has 12 elements instead of 6. Uh, D6, the hexagonal symmetry, uh, uh, has um, the hexagonal rotation of 60 degrees. And 
60 degrees squared is 120, which is what we're working with in D3. So R R1 and R2 is the hexagonal rotation squared for R1, and then that squared again for the uh, H4 giving R R squared. Okay. So, you see H's in here, you have to replace them uh, according to this uh, identification. And I'll show the whole text D6 um, group in just a minute here. But let's take an example we already did. Rho 1 times R to the first power equal Rho 2. Well, Hamilton's turns would say, okay, this is coming first, so you've got to find an arc uh, R to the first power, there it is, you've got to slide that arc around, it would fit very nicely right here, uh, and you see what I want to do is I want to do R1 first, and then do, uh, uh, well, do row 1 first, and then do uh, R1, okay? So, um, that, that means I would uh, either take minus row 1, okay, right here, okay, do that first, and then uh, do, oh, I'm sorry, let's see if I do that right, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, this one wants to do R1 first, okay, so I, there's R1 in position already, and then there's row 1 there, but it's minus row 1, you, you see, there's the real row 1 right there, the one hasn't had the phase uh, change, okay, and your answer is, if you use minus row 1, you get row 2. Or, if you don't, you put a minus sign on this. So, the electronic group theory is um, got minus signs on it. This doesn't. This is a U2 result. This is an R3 result. They'll always be within a sign of each other, plus or minus. Now, this is just a warning. <laughs> I'm not asking you to understand all of this yet. Yeah, we'll uh, think of examples that make it possible to visualize this uh, even more clearly. But you, you should see already that we've got a lot of power here uh, with this method, as opposed to just this thing. This thing doesn't have the, the signs uh, on it. Now here's uh, another example. Here's where the spinners, remember the quaternions were minus i times our sigmas. So these are actual quaternion matrices here, okay? That we'll, we'll derive those later on. This is our group D2. If you don't care about the signs, it's really simple. Just ignore the signs and realize that um, x times x is 1, x times y is z, x times z is y. That's it. And we, those were the uh, multiplication rules for the Pauli operators A, B, and C. Remember, A was uh, the Z, okay, and this is minus I times sigma Z, Pauli's name, minus I times sigma C, and minus I times C, balanced, chiral, and asymmetric diagonal uh, operators that we talked about before. Well, anyway, if you expand this group to 8 by calling the minus elements by a different name, and that's what you have to do in group theory, this is a fine table for an algebra, and that's all we really need. But if you're going to be persnickety like a group theorist, you've got to obey the group rules, then the group is twice as big, and that's called the quaternion group Q. It's pretty queer. Now, here's another group that uh, is twice as big. Uh, uh, this is the D6 uh, group, which is, and this is a little symbol we use a lot. It, it means greater than, but it means contains. D6 contains D3, or you turn it around, D3 is contained by uh, D6. But just think of it as a greater than sign. The greater thing sits on the thing where it's big, and the littler thing sits where it's coming together. Now later we're going to show that D6 is nothing but D3 cross C2, just like C6 is nothing but C3 cross C2. So if I can get the arithmetic done for this, I know all this. That, just to show you that there's some really big groups that can be divided and conquered. That's the name of the game uh, as far as uh, being a good group theorist. 
uh, quite apart from the representation matrices, which is what the physicist wants. And he not only wants the representation matrices, uh, he wants them reduced. They're, we're very lazy. Okay, so uh, I want to show you something else about multiplications. Now, I made a, a big fuss about this uh, in lecture 8, right around page 70 or so, um, how the uh, uh, rotations obviously do not commute, you see. Because if I, uh, t in, in making two elements uh, meet here, a product R theta prime um, with, say, R inverse theta, or this product right here, R theta prime with just plain old uh, R theta, okay, I get a very different result when they're flipped. They obviously do not commute. One of them makes this brown arc down there, and the other one makes this blue arc up here, you see. And it's pretty, if you were doing this in a plane, you'd say they're the same thing. They'd just be parallel lines, but they're not. This red arc here is very different from this brown arc right here. Uh, they're not parallel. The planes intersect somewhere. They're great circles, just like all of these arcs are, and they intersect somewhere. So the, uh, what we would like to do is understand uh, that little uh, item here, but we'd also like to understand a transformation of an operator, where you do an operator times the operator. You don't stop there. You take the inverse and undo it, and if it's a non-commutative group, well, this is going to be a different operator. Otherwise, it'll just be the same operator in an abelian group. So the a transformation of operators is a key thing. And it's visualizable uh, with Hamilton terms. And we'll, I'll keep showing this to you until finally uh, we stop and really make some sense of it. But um, there is the thing that we, when we first mentioned this. Instead, we'll just do it for this group. And this is not a hard thing to do. Forget the signs. This is classical object. No spin halves. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to rotate the actual operator. Okay? Now you can see uh, what it would do uh, to. Um, a typical operator, say, uh, what we've got here, we've got, um, uh, I'm, I'm rotating uh, row three, that's this uh, plane, and I'm, I'm moving the whole plane, you see. In the other case, when we were making the group table, we didn't touch those things. Now we're going to touch them, okay? So I'm going to do an actual operation that moves the hardware over here, okay? So this is row uh, a one is what it's, it, it, it's, it's telling us. It's telling us that if I do an operation R1 on row three, and I mean four and F, here's the operator, here's its inverse. Okay? Say R and R dagger, if you want to use unitary basis. Okay? Well, uh, that's R1, row three, times r squared. And we claim that's going to come out of row one, okay? That's we have to check, okay? Need to check that with what we've got here, right? So I've got r times row three, r first power times row one, row two, row three, that's row two, okay, right there. Now we've got to get row two times r squared. Row 2 times r squared, right there. Bingo! Checks out. Okay? This is the kind of transformation you want to do when you're talking about classes of elements of the group. What you're doing is you're studying the symmetry of the symmetry. What you're doing is saying, this is almost the same as this element, except for that transformation. And this element's the same as that one, except for the inverse transformation, you see. But I don't see any transformations here that can convert this thing to that. 
that would be something in very high dimensions. But in a little thing we've got here with six elements, we do want to do that sort of thing. Okay, now here's, here's another one to check. What happens if I do row one to row three? It just flips it over to row two, right? That's telling me row one times row three times row one inverse, the row one is its own inverse, right? Should give me, well, row one times row three, I think we've already done that one. Row one times row three is r squared. And then r squared times row one, there it is, row two. Check. Okay. Is it 180 degree rotation? That's what the rows all are. If you're talking D3, which we are here, okay, D3 operators, okay, and operations of operations. And yes, we're flipping them over. 180, absolutely. Okay? So that means you can visualize these transformations using this thing too. You just have to remember what you're doing. Now you're actually working on the operators. Row 3 takes R2 and puts it there. And it takes row 2 and puts it where the R2 is. If you did the inverse. Okay? And it takes this guy over to there. And row 3 takes row 3 into 1 and 1 into row 3. Oh, we knew that one. Okay? Okay? This one is interesting because row 3 acting on row 3. This one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of change. Yeah. The only inverse channel. Okay. Now, um, this is where it gets hairy. But I think if you go at this right, it's really simple. Isn't it? But you know, I should say that because I've been thinking about this for so long. But one of the things that uh, came uh, up when I worried about molecular frames was. Um, what is a molecular frame? A molecular is a bunch of waves. How can I make a frame? And uh, that's where I got started thinking about all that relativity stuff. But so far, we have been doing abelian commutative groups like C6 as in all their outer products. And that's all the abelian groups are. Every abelian group is just an outer product of cyclic groups. That's something you can prove pretty easily using our spectral methods. You might think about how do you do that. That's a, a good problem to solve. But anyway, we've been taking uh, a Hamiltonian and we've diagnosed by RP symmetry operators that commute with H. So we demanded that the H have some symmetry of one of these things, okay? And that meant that it would transform H into H, or better stated, uh, it would commute uh, with H. These uh, symmetry operators would commute with H. And uh, because they were commutative groups, uh, these uh, things had to commute with each other. Okay? PQ was P plus Q, and that's the same as QP. So there we are, we're kind of stuck. How in the world do we deal with symmetries? And you've seen the, the, the uh, sort of the zoo of groups, right? And you can see from the zoo of groups that those white things occupy almost all of the um, population. These things are the Neanderthals. They're practically extinct. It's this kind of thing. D3 to OH for crystals. But U2, uh, definitely not commutative. Okay? So, while we'll still have uh, the Hamiltonian symmetry defined by a commutation relation, that is, the Hamiltonian itself is going to commute with the elements of one of these things. Most of these things do not have elements that commute with each other. Pick any two elements out of there and the probability that you get uh, this to be equal to that is, is very small. 
So how are we going to pull this off? How can we express a Hamiltonian in terms of things that commute with it and not have the things themselves uh, commute with each other? This is just Fourier analysis. We're asking for something more here. That's what we need to learn now. So this is a crucial turning point in this course. Crucial. Okay, we're doing it in a way that has, you will not find anywhere except here. <laughs> Brag a little bit. That's the question. So how do we write H in terms of non-commutative U? How do we do that? Okay, this brings up what I call the mock mock principle. The question of global versus local. And this goes way back, this question, this whole way of relativity, generalized, okay? It goes back to Archimedes, he says, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. It goes back to Van Vleck, the guy that first thought of the stuff that became the uh, eventually the Jan Teller stuff, which became uh, what the high energy physicists are, are, are touting um, as their uh, god particle, the Higgs boson. Kashmir, the Kashmir invariance of Lie algebras. The physicists have quite come out. Mach, Mach's principle, which Newton would have read ridiculed, but still would have been intrigued by, and as I said, Archimedes. Okay? It is the realization that this isn't the whole story. Just talking about opera operators like we have been with cranks that sit in the laboratory and move some helpless little uh, thing that has an internal frame, and that's what bugged me, is I could sort of see the frames that I have in my world, but the thing down here if it's car mechanical, how could it have a frame? Well, we just say that it does. So we must make a distinction and clearly make use of the operators that are fixed to that frame, whatever it is. That is, there must be uh, something about a wave that makes a coordinate system. And we, we were showing you that. We were showing the uh, standing waves that make a very nice Cartesian coordinate system. So that's the answer to where's the frame, at least for a very simple example like that. So we're going to have, as we did in the laboratory with this machine here, uh, operations around the z-axis, around the y-axis, or around anywhere, but that's all you need to carry out the Euler angle constructions that we talked about. <clears throat> a beta operator and an alpha or gamma operator. You could do the same thing from the inside. And you can create the fiction uh, for these people, whoever they are, that are living in this world, uh, that they are moving the whole universe. When they turn their crank, they're going to see the universe move. Now, you could say, oh, those silly people. They're not moving the universe, they're just going the other way. But if all you care about is the relative position of this and this, who cares? They're just as right as you are. And moreover, and this is the key thing, if that's the case, then this operation commutes with all of those. And I don't care how badly they commute with each other or how badly these commute with each other. They don't, that's for sure. Every one of these commutes with every one of those. Because they're independent. I can move that guy in, be my laboratory self, or I can be in the body and move the universe all different places that's independent, not entangled with things that are going here. And that is where I bring in what I call the mock-mock relativity principle. Is that from a starting position, remember Euler angle 0, 0, 0, starting from a, a 
unit position, we will simply demand that anything I do with this one is the same as them doing it backwards, inversely. So this equation is true for only one state. It is not true to call these operators equal. No. They're only equal with respect to the original state out of which you generate all of the other states. That's the mock mock principle. But the question is, how do you actually make matrix operations that do that? How do you pull this off? It's nice to talk about it, but you've got to write something down to do the calculations. You've got to give something to the computer to eat. So we're going to show how you do that. Here we are back with D3. This time I'm pulling stuff out of the <clears throat> chapter 15, uh, unit 5 of the um, quantum theory for the computer age. And uh, it's just the same table. I've uh, replaced the sigmas with i, or I should say I've replaced since then the i's with sigmas in most of the things I do, or rows. If it's rotations like these, then row is the correct uh, symbol uh, uh, right now. And so, you know, here's one and row three together. Uh, here's one and I three together. See, imagine these are little quantum dots that can have waves on them. And they're making a little D3 propeller uh, there. Uh, or imagine there's a potential well uh, for one and I three uh, sitting on the I three axis, which uh, is coming right out of there. And actually, uh, the well would be over here. That's a barrier on the other side. And then there's R and I2. You can see R to the first power and rho 2 next to each other. So that's um, a two-sided well. And then finally R squared and rho 1. Here's R squared and I1. So everything jives except for a little bit of notational change here. And the um, lab fixed, and we're talking ex extrinsic global. I'm using this now because we're going to have the other thing, body fixed, intrinsic, local operations uh, that go with these. But this is what we're used to. The ob object, whatever it is, uh, that is a wave, uh, gets moved uh, over uh, relative to the, the laboratory equipment, which is considered to be the potential. Okay? So there's a typical I2 operation. Here's I2. It flips it over to make a state I2 out of the state 1. Okay. Typical uh, group transitivity, if you will, uh, use terminology from mathematics. Okay. So using that, we're going to make a matrix, just like we did with C6, out of the group table. Okay. Now, one, this time, uh, we uh, write down our elements, 1, R, R squared, I1, I2, I3, row 1, row 2, row 3, uh, on the column. And then I switch them with the inverses. R goes to R squared, R squared goes to R. So there's a little switcheroo there. These uh, switch, but they're their own inverses, so nothing happens to them. They're in the same order here as they are here. And that's a table out of which I can make all the regular representations, remember that's what they call the big R matrix that represents each of these six operations. Uh, it's just a matrix with ones placed where the element of interest uh, is. For example, I've colored the I3's green here, and so uh, the representation for I3 is going to be a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in the positions of the elements in the table. And similarly with this one for uh, I2, you see, uh, I2 here, here, and here makes me have a 1 here, here, and there. And then uh, I1, okay, shows up here, here, and here. Makes me a little sub-diagonal there as well as up there, you see. So there's all of those 180 degrees. And then these are just cyclic matrices. We've seen these before, okay, these little guys, okay. So there's a nice representation. 
okay, done by the lab guy or girl, okay? What about the body girl or guy? <laughs> That's what they're going to make. This is the G, G dagger table. I want to do a G dagger G table. I'm going to line my elements up on the top here the way I like them and then do a flip. Now, the only difference is I flip the R and the R squared again, okay? But I make a whole new arrangement in here, okay? Now instead of getting this for I3, I get a anti-diagonal matrix right there. For I2, I had this thing, like a sort of a reflected one. I had this one right here where I had little diagonal things. Well, I get this thing for I1. Uh, you can see where the I1s are there. Um, <clears throat> where is the, ooh, uh, that's a typo. Uh, there should be an I1 right there and right there. That, I don't know how that happened. I'm just now noticing it, okay? But in any case, uh, that's the correct result for I1, then R squared and R, okay? Uh, they're kind of the inverses of each other. Not quite, though, because this is the same as that, whereas that is the same as that, okay? And then this. Now, either one of these obeys the multiplication table, the same multiplication table. This is just reordered. But here's the magic. This is the main result. Any of these six matrices, even ones that do not commute, will commute with any of these. Wow, that's exactly what we want. I'm going to make the Hamiltonians out of this and call that the symmetry. Oh, I can play it backwards. I'll make Hamiltonian out of these and call this the symmetry. Bingo! Go to work. That's what the rest of the course is going to be about. How to handle this. How to do this. And what happens. Global versus local symmetry expansion. Okay? This is a relativity duality idea. Okay? We're going to write the Hamiltonian in terms of these red things with little bars over it. Bar means you're in the body. That's your, your, your friend. This is laboratory. You don't put any uh, embellishments on the uh, up, uh, primes or anything like we have here. Okay? So these are made from local symmetry matrices. This is going to be the local intrinsic uh, body frame representation. And that's what we make the Hamiltonian of. And then we're guaranteed it has a symmetry by computing with all of these guys. So that's kind of cool. That means that we're going to draw little Feynman diagrams for every one of the elements that actually moves things intrinsically within the frame of the molecule. That they're the ones that know about where their pathways are, where are the things they can move to physically. We're talking about physical things. So that is what the Hamiltonian is going to look like. And it's guaranteed to have this symmetry. So we can take projection operators of this and slice that up. Well, that's easy, more easily said than done because these don't come in. We can't diagonalize all of those at once. We've got to have these help us. Okay, so all the global G commute with this whole matrix. No matter what values I put in for those parameters. And I'm going to name the parameters by the group elements, which name the states. So we're using the group notation for both the states and the amplitudes, the tuttling amplitudes, or the coupling constants, these things. And they're going to have various conjugation relations, just like the C6 did. So we're just doing C6 all over again, except the symmetry doesn't uh, all commute with itself. So it, it's a lot more physics that can pop up uh, because of that. Okay, so these are the actual elements, you see, R1 is called uh, 
are one. <laughs> and it is the conjugate of that because we want to make this matrix for mission. If you don't, you don't need to demand that. We didn't have to do that in C6 either if you wanted to do a unitary uh, uh, operator of some kind, S matrix or something like that. Okay? Then R2 is R1 star, I1 and I, they have real, this is real, this is real. Okay, so all those guys are real. Uh, just these guys are going to make a current both. That's cool by itself already. Okay. Now we just have, ooh, we're getting uh, close here. I do want to get through this before we uh, quit. Um, I want to get the first part of the spectral decomposition. Remember, these things don't commute, but these do. And that's what we need to talk about. A class sum. And what is a class? I mean, these, these are things that we need to talk about. Now, what I'm showing you here is a, a Venn diagram, sort of a set diagram, of the entire algebra. I'm imagining a six-dimensional space, but I'm indicating it by sets of various kinds of combinations of those six things. And I've fogged it out so I don't have to talk about it very much. But altogether, there are six independent things here, three of which commute with each other. It's either these guys here in the unit, they, we're gonna, I'm going to show you, they commute with each other, or linear combinations of them that make projectors that have funny names like A1, A2, and E1 uh, that will be our uh, so-called irreducible uh, representation generators. And this is the, what's called the center. I call all commuting operators. That's what they are. These are operators commute with everything in the entire algebra, which can be huge. The center can be very small. Here it's half of the group. So, well, it's the smallest non-abelian group. So what do you expect? You're going to have some speciality there. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the classes. We're going to talk about those operators that transform into uh, each other, basically, using operators in the group. And what we're interested in is, first of all, the order of the group is six, but we're also interested in the order of each class. Uh, and I've broken the classes out here. It's pretty obvious. There are the I's, there are the little R's, and there's one, three classes. Okay? And the order of the first class, the zeroth class, uh, is one. The order of the uh, rotation 120 degree class is two. There are two elements in it. And the uh, uh, I class, your 180s, the I class, I'm calling it now instead of rho, uh, and there's three of those. Okay. So those are the numbers that we're going to be throwing about as we uh, work with this. And the whole idea is that this um, transformation, uh, any group operator, uh, of this thing gives it back again. And we can kind of see that when we did those transformations. Any time I took an, a row one and did any operation to it, I had to get another one of the rows. So any operation I did to a row class is just going to give me back the class. question is, uh, what about a combination of all of the elements in a class? Will that uh, be uh, uh, invariant? And the answer is yes it is, and we, we need to show that. We need to show that in a group theoretical way as well as an algebraic way. And it helps to see things two different ways to make sense out of it. But essentially what I wanted to find for each um, element is I want to uh, define a um, <coughs> self-symmetry. Um, a self-symmetry will just be a subgroup of this group maybe the whole group, in the first case, uh, the, of elements that commute with the operator, like the unit operator. Who's, what's the self-symmetry of the unit operator? Well, it's the whole damn group. Everything here commutes with one, by definition. So the order of the self-symmetry of one is six. Now, how many elements uh, commute uh, with the R? Okay. Well, R and R inverse commute with each other, actually, but let's just talk about R by itself. It commutes with itself, itself squared, 
and it's self-cubed, which is 1. So there are three operators that commute with the R. That's the cell symmetry of the 120 degree class. Then the 180 degree class, who commutes with them? I1 commute with I2? No way. I1 commute with R? No way. R squared? No way. One? Yes. I1 and 1. I1 with I2? No way. I1 with I3? No way. I1 with itself and 1. That's it. 2. That's the self-symmetry. See, this is turning group theory onto group theory. Making group theory look at itself. That's what you, your, your psychologist or psychiatrist will make you do. You look at yourself, right? Carefully, okay? So that's what it's, do, it's doing here, okay? And what turns out is this is really cool. The order of the self-symmetry is the order of the group, in this case six, divided by the order of the class. Now, how does that happen? This is, this is uh, uh, something we need to discuss, how, how that uh, uh, carries out, okay? So, uh, here we're going to go ahead and maybe make some sense out of that. The, uh, I'm claiming that this is true, so we've got to uh, check and see. This 0SK is an integer count of D3 operators, GS, that commute with a particular element, K. We're interested in self-symmetry of the K-class, okay? GS uh, formed the self-symmetry group. Each GS transforms GK into itself. So I apply one of these uh, self-symmetry operators to GK. GK is all that comes out, okay? So if an operator GT transforms GK into a different element of its class, say, T takes K to GK prime, then so does this operator right here. That is G uh, that did this terrible thing uh, times the G that does nothing to that element, GS. Well, that's an important thing. That is, if I have this thing multiplying GK on this side, and there it is being inversed, the inverse flips that around, so GS inverse uh, let that thing go outside, and I'm, I'm right here with something I said was nothing but GK. So uh, this is called a left coset uh, when you make a whole set of these things. GK, SK, G, uh, I'm sorry, G1 here uh, it is, uh, we're looking at a G1. Uh, and then we have all the elements in the cell symmetry, okay? And I make a coset of that, whatever the cell symmetry is, I make a coset that has to be different elements than these. And then if there's another coset, it has to be different elements from everything that's come before it. Okay? So I make a certain number of cosets, and those cosets have to evenly divide the group, in this case D3, into uh, some fraction. Uh, the order of the class divided by the order of the symmetrizer. That is evenly, integers, uh, inter in integer subsections. So that's the clue uh, to uh, this thing. The order of the group is equal to the product of the order of the class and the order of the symmetrizer of the elements in that class. I call these results Lagrange's coset theorems, plural, because it's taking care of two things. Lagrange's theorem is just this thing right here. Order of group evenly divisible by these uh, orders of any subgroup in the group. But here we show the, the ratio, the group product of the uh, order of the class and the order of the cell symmetry. So that is really kind of neat. That then gives you this. The order of the cell symmetry is the order of the group divided by the order of the class. So that means when I sum over G, uh, I can get that element K to uh, normalize. I can just say, well, I'm going to sum over every single element in the group, but I'm going to divide by the order of the cell symmetry because this will break up into those that leave GK alone, and then the coset that, that changes it to another uh, element of the class and another element of the class until you've exhausted the class. That is pretty crucial to uh, what we'll uh, be doing uh, here. Now, the question is, uh, can we go another five minutes? And maybe it's a good idea 
uh, really to stop at this point because what I need to do is I want to do a spectral resolution of the center mm. of the class algebra. And the class algebra just consists of the group table boiled down to this, where I sum uh, those elements, one, two, and three, we call it K3, sum these elements, and of course that one's all by itself, unit, okay? And then I do a product of this sum with that sum, it's all written here for me, it's two ones, two times K1, plus, well, there's K2 right there. K2. So this is making a, not a group table, but an algebra table. And then if I multiply, uh, say, uh, K2 by K3, K3 is the sum of these three things, you can see what you're going to get. You're going to get the sum of the three things times two. Okay? And you're going to get the same thing down here. It commutes, you see. So this is a commutative algebra. We can take that apart with the spectral item potent uh, deal. Simultaneously diagonalize every one of those things. That's called resolving the unit in the center. That's a big name for it, mathematics. Yeah, well our physicists are, are, are turned on by that, aren't they? <laughs> so it makes it a problem <laughs> for group theory uh, when you don't really understand what the hell they're talking about. But you can see that all these are mutually commuting with respect to themselves, and they are all commuting with respect to the whole group. So they're really powerful. The center is like the DNA of the group. It's invariant. No matter how you define your group, no matter what notation you use, you're still going to have the structure that's seen uh, by this uh, center. Okay? The sum here over all H transforming G gives me a linear combination of classes uh, by that theorem, where the coefficient is that ratio, that integer that we talked about. And it must evenly divide the group uh, as well. So the basic idea is we're going to take, for example, K3 looks the most powerful. So I say, OK, well, what's K3 squared? Well, it's 3K plus uh, uh, 3K2 plus uh, 3 times 1. Okay? And then I go and I say, well, what's, uh, if that's the case, OK, let's m multiply uh, uh, again. And what you end up with is k cubed, k3 cubed minus 9k3 is 0. And that gives you these three roots of a, a, proje of a projector equation, basically a uh, hamilton cayley equation of this algebra. So that's what we all want to look at. Because each of the combinations if I take these two things and leave that one out, I make a projector. And there's the thing I left out. It has to be zero, right? So K3 times that thing has to be three, that root right there. There's the root. Forget the minus sign. Now there's a minus three in there as well. That one's coming next. Okay. I take these two factors, leave that one out, okay? That will then give me uh, this relationship here. Zero, I put it back, times this thing I'm going to call PA2. That's projection operator A2. Okay, these are the two standard notation now I'm using uh, for these results. Okay, it's got a root of minus three. This one has a root of plus three, so that's kind of nice. And then we look at that, those two right there, okay, having left this thing out. To, this just class K3 minus 0 times this thing, PE, consists of the product of these two. Now remember, these commute. Everything here commutes. Otherwise, we can't do this. Okay? And what we're going to end up with is a projection operator made out of the products that I've outlined there. That's the result. That's the, the flip of that. And here's where you, you get to see the eigenvalues uh, of each of these projectors. Okay, 3 and minus 3, 
uh, coming in uh, for this one, okay, and zero for that one, okay. And then two, the, the, this is the uh, eigenvalue that you get uh, for kr, and, and then k1, you know it has to be a completeness relation, so you don't have to look at that one very carefully. So that is the basic idea. You now have projection operators, which you can then apply to the entire group algebra. Very powerful. But the coefficients of them is called the uh, 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 non-abelian character table. And that's what you're seeing uh, right here. This is the, if I can get some of the trash out of the way here. Um, that is the character table. Uh, consisting of 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, minus 1, mi 1, minus 1, 0, that are the coefficients uh, of the expansion uh, of this uh, guy right here. Uh, or this one, this is probably the one to look at. 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 0. Okay, that's, that's it. That's what we're after. Once we get this, then we have many routes that we can uh, follow uh, after we've uh, uh, taken care of the center, then we can decide what physics do we want to do and go in a particular direction uh, in this roadmap of the D3 algebra. So that is uh, what we're after. The irreducible characters and traces of the, they are the traces of the irreducible representation. I have to show you that uh, with some slides that follow here. But I want to point out that the first numbers that show up in this character table are the dimensions. We'll prove that um, next, and it'll be next time. Uh, these are singlet, these are singlet, that's a doublet. And that's what's new about a non-abelian group. It has to have representations that can't be reduced any further. They're called the irreducible representations, or irrep is what I like calling it, because that's a mouthful. I call it irrep, irrep. Okay, and there are several numbers that, uh, that these things too. The zeroth power sum of these numbers is just the number of classes. There are as many of these projectors as there are classes, just because the class algebra respect would become the decomposing here. Okay, the rank, this is something that people don't talk about. The sum of the dimensions, one plus one plus two is four here. This number of that's the number of irreducible item potents that you will be getting out of these things when you split them further. And finally, the order of the group is the sum of the squares of these numbers. 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared is 6. 1 plus 1 plus 4. Look like magic? It is. <laughs> but it's really beautiful and you will see a very logical magnet. The center is going to take care of the reduction into irreducible item modes of various kinds. You have freedom now. You don't get just stuck with one kind of projector. There's all kinds of different physics that you can be doing depending on whether you take the red set or the green set or the turquoise blue set. There are all kinds of different uh, sets that you can choose depending on whether you have moving waves, elliptical functions, chiral waves, you name it. Very similar to our ABC stuff in that respect. So we got to learn how to do that. And uh, I think this is a good time uh, to stop. But anyway, there are the numbers uh, for this particular group. And that's the first thing you want to look at uh, when you get a new group or a new symmetry of some kind that's not abelian. Um, OK, the rest of it is proving what I just said here, so it's probably a good time uh, to call it, and uh, we'll uh, return on Thursday, hopefully, to do something with these big matrices, the six by sixes.